a mob of vengeful peasants, a crumbling castle of mutant beastmen, and a black subterranean sea beneath a golden pyramid blazing with the sacrificial fires of raw chaos. This is your Game Master's Guide to Sailors on the Starless Sea, an incredibly fun, memorable, and popular beginner adventure written for Dungeon Crawl Classics, but totally functional with like any other D20 fantasy system like Dungeons and Dragons. So please do not let that minor distinction prevent you from running this adventure. I've run it a few times and I'm excited to share its awesomeness with you because I'm Bob, this is where we learn how to have more fun playing RPGs together. And first, this is not sponsored. In fact, videos like this really need your support to reach a wider audience. So remember to like, share, subscribe, or comment as you see fit, especially to share your stories and tips for running this epic module. And maybe consider using the affiliate link below to pick it up and follow along. Thanks. Boom! This adventure is designed for 10 to 15 zero level characters, with each player running three characters. Yeah, you can run it with a regular party of level 1 D&D characters, but for that full DCC experience, you're gonna want to watch the videos in the description about level 0 character creation. Personally, I prefer 4 level 0 DCC characters per player to a maximum of 20 in the party. That way, players who are used to more heroic games or who just love throwing themselves into danger can all have fun losing their first one to two peasants. For background, all you need to know as the GM is that two ancient chaos lords ruled from this now crumbling keep. One died in battle, and the other, quote, gave up his mortal shell, commending his damned soul into the writhing limbs of the gods of chaos. You know, like we all wanna do on Mondays. And today, that lord's beastmen cultists are sacrificing villagers to resurrect him. But once your characters are ready to go, I recommend reading aloud the first two paragraphs on the back cover of the book. This passage is way more evocative and informative than the player start descriptive text. Since time immemorial, you and your people have toiled in the shadow of the Cyclopean ruins, of mysterious origins and the source of many a superstition they have always been considered a secret, best left unknown by the folk of your hamlet. But now something stirs beneath the crumbling keep. Beastmen howl in the night, and your fellow villagers are snatched from their beds with no heroes to defend you. Who will rise to stand against the encircling darkness? The secrets of chaos are yours to unearth, but at what cost to sanity or soul? I love that. Then follow it up by randomly distributing one rumor to each player, either have them roll 1d10 on the table and read what they got, or make some little handouts, because everyone loves little handouts. Take a hot minute to discuss the rumors as a group, then introduce the first encounter by reading the final line from the player's start. You turn to your companions and ready your meager weapons. The time for retribution has come. Then jump right to the description for Area A, Devil's Causeway briefly describing the path up to the crumbling keep, flanked by two wooden poles, each with a missing villager's body bound to it by thorny vines, still wriggling, gross. So, to actually entice your players, I recommend revealing some of the non-descriptive text right away. One body is still carrying a short sword and dagger, and lo, these are the stolen sons of the village smith, who might be one of the peasants in your party. But most importantly, End your brief description with an invitational, what do you do? Unless the PCs preemptively attack or immediately take some other precautions, one of these thorny vine creatures strikes brutally. Even though these two vine horrors can move as written, I just keep them on their posts with about a 30 foot reach. That way the PCs can flee up to the keep if they want to, but this first encounter is also the perfect time to remind your DCC players about burning points of luck to keep their level zero characters alive, especially if this is a one-shot. Now, facing the keep, I recommend just stating the four most obvious entry points and only reading the descriptive text if they ask for more details. One, the open portcullis in the gatehouse. Two, the ruined but traversable wall to the northwest. Three, the intact but climbable wall around most of the keep, and four, the giant sinkhole to the northeast, which features, quote, tortured faces and writhing forms that appear briefly in the mists above your heads, only to dissolve 
back into nothingness as quickly as they appeared. More on that later. And we're going to cover these areas in a different order from the book, because I think the book's order is weird. So the gatehouse, Area C, has disturbing animal sounds made by two hidden beastmen waiting to drop the portcullis on somebody. As written, this drop is an attack roll, but I prefer it as a DC-10 save based on how the player describes their character avoiding the danger, which is 1d6 damage per round while pinned beneath it, but statistically, that finishes a level zero character right away, so don't worry about tracking it. And if the PCs make a ruckus here, these beastmen are supposed to ring a big bell and then run to their buddies in Area H, the tower, but I have them do that if the PCs make a ruckus anywhere in the keep. For example, at the ruined wall, Area B, which might collapse on everyone, but dwarves and miners or any PCs who pause to inspect the rubble get an easy check to lead the party through it without causing a collapse, which is also written as an attack roll that I prefer as a saving throw because it's 1d10 damage to all PCs on the slope could easily spell TPK. Interestingly, a collapse also reveals the entrance to the Tomb of the Fallen, Area B1, which we'll cover in a minute. But entrance number three, the intact climbable wall is just described as 30 feet high, DC 15 to climb, or fall for a deadly 2D6 damage. So I say if they just use a rope and don't do anything silly, they do it. And the sinkhole, Area G. It's not super clear, but I assume there's a narrow edge around this pit that the characters can use to enter the keep. First, however, approaching PCs have the eerie premonition that the earth is hollow beneath them as if they were walking on a frozen lake. Then there's a save to avoid falling and a bunch of other roles and details that makes me think the author really doesn't want the party to go this way. So however they get in, the ruined keep has a couple distinct areas. And if you're short on time for this adventure as a one shot, this is where you can cut some encounters without severely impacting the player's experience. For example, area F, the well of souls is really cool but it could easily be combined with that sinkhole because it's just another magical pit of chaos. But be sure to use the well's rules for corruption and consider adding a random mutation from the Beastman table as a visceral lore drop because apparently the Beastmen are created by dipping villagers into this well. That's almost as wild as area B1, the Tomb of the Fallen. Not sure if that's a pun, because presumably your party just made a save to survive that collapsing rubble, or because this room kills the clock for your one-shot session. One-shot session. A check to read runes on the door. A hard check to open the door. A save to avoid 1d10 fire damage as the door opens. Then saves each round to avoid slowing and freezing in the tomb. Saves to avoid slipping on the ice. And multiple checks to steal the absolutely sick looking battle axe and armor from the frozen corpse of this fallen chaos lord. Of course, just like climbing the wall, you don't have to use the DC if the party's solution just makes sense but be mindful of the pace here and definitely ignore the 16 strength requirement to wield that awesome chaotic battle ax, especially if this is a one shot, just, just let them use the cool ax. <laughs> Area E of the keep is the Charnel Ruins, a burned chapel with an extremely Elden Ring flavored description, encounter, and loot. You just gotta read it yourself, but if you do decide to cut this area, I highly recommend relocating the loot so your PCs have a chance to find it elsewhere and use it creatively. Area D, the courtyard itself, just has some animal tracks, beastmen, and a forgotten cache of hidden treasure, weapons, and healing powder, but it can only be found by PCs explicitly searching the courtyard, and it has a DC 30 check to open. Yikes. Again, encourage creative solutions. And Area H, Tower of the Beast, has an open doorway on the upper level and a barred door on the bottom level, DC 20 or five minutes of chopping to break in, where they'll face six beastmen who fight as long as their captain lives and try to imprison the PCs alongside an abstract number of other villagers chained here who are really just replacement PCs if a player happened to lose all their characters already. Otherwise, these prisoners are too weak to fight. Also, if the whole party is captured here, the adventure can continue because the Beastmen will lead their prisoners down to Area 1-1, Trail of Gold, a corridor between two secret doors. One connects to Area B-1, Tomb of the Fallen, and the other is a partially open door to Area 1-1-A, the Empty Vault, 
with some scattered gold and an empty chest that has a poorly hidden compartment and a trap that might kill a level zero character. But the main path leads to area one, two, the dread halls, where everyone must immediately make a save to resist a strange compulsion to expect the base of the pool. Which makes the pool seem super evil, but actually doing so calls forth a glowing skull. And the PCs don't know it yet, but these basically function as holy hand grenades in the final battle. So I only let them take about five skulls max if they decide to take any at all. This room also has some lore dropping mosaics, which you should totally present as a fun handout because everyone loves fun handouts. And there are four chaos cult robes hidden in the corners of the room and a giant drain under those tons of skulls at the base of the pool that can flush it all down to area one three with a lost magic ring that no one in my groups has ever found. But either way, the party descends to area one four, the starless sea a dark shore with tracks from beastmen and villagers, a ghostly ship in the water, a golden glow across the sea, and an ancient standing stone on the beach. Be sure to mention that this monolith has stairs leading up it because the descriptive text only mentions its strange carvings and looking at those triggers a save to resist offering an ally to the chaos leviathan in the water. Yeah, but just climbing those stairs reveals an unlit candle at the top when lit, brings the ship to shore. In any case, halfway across the water, the PCs are supposed to sacrifice something to the Chaos Leviathan in the Starless Sea, but they probably don't know that. So after five rounds, the nameless thing just starts grabbing characters left and right, and the book thoroughly describes how to handle this encounter. So I'm not gonna cover it here, besides saying that despite the apparent danger, there's very little excuse for the adventure to end at this encounter. Rather, they make it across the water to Area 1-5, the Temple of Chaos, where a horde of two dozen beastmen lead a chain of villagers up the ramps of a golden, fiery cigarette. Now hear this. The player's only goal here is to reach the top of the ziggurat and stop whatever ritual is going on up there. And your only goal here is to facilitate any plan they come up with that prevents this encounter from becoming a horrible sloggy combat against 22 beastmen right before the actual final fight at the top of the ziggurat, which is way, way, way cooler. <laughs> the peak of the temple is dominated by a vast smoking pit that glows with a hellish light. A mighty beastman hoists an effigy of a fearsome armored figure high into the swirling clouds as prisoners are hurled, screaming, one after another, into the pit. A trio of snarling beastmen upends woven baskets pouring thousands of coins after your fellow villagers, producing gouts of hissing smoke and flame all about you is this thundering cacophony of drums and bestial howls as the bizarre ritual nears its climax. This is it. As soon as the PCs are spotted up here or if they hesitate at all, the priest immolates the effigy and on the next round, it rises, an avatar of the Chaos Lord, ready to fight to the death. Meanwhile, the priest and acolytes protect their lord, and the beastmen from the ramp file their way up, about two per round, trying to grab and hurl your remaining PCs into the fire. So, with those now shining skull grenades, some clever thinking, or just a large number of PCs who survived to this point, there's a good chance that they'll kill the Chaos Lord, scare off the remaining beastmen, and trigger the collapse of this entire cavern. As written, they have a 1d6 plus two actions to escape to the ship, and they don't know how much time they have, but I find it way more fun to just roll that d4 timer out in the open, taking one round to safely reach the ship, and they can spend any other rounds trying to scoop up gold coins or grab the Chaos Lord's mighty flail before a massive tidal wave launches the ship into their next adventure. I think much of the love for Sailors on the Starless Sea comes from this incredible climax, and I highly encourage you to try it at your table with whatever D20 fantasy system you like to play. Remember to give this video a thumbs up and share your thoughts down in the comments. Maybe check out this other DCC video on your screen and give it up for the Bob World Builder patrons whose direct support allows me to make videos like this one. Thank you. Keep building.